In 2008, a team of archaeologists were at work here at the Bobkin Theatre and Fisher Gate. What they found was over 100 skeletons together in the mass grave. They'd been respectfully buried, carefully placed side by side in neat rows. Three years later, in 2011, carbon dating tests showed these bodies to have originated from the English Civil War. These individuals, when they lived, not only witnessed but participated in the bloodiest conflict ever fought on English soil. Their fates lie in the events of the summer of 1644, when two armies, one imposing the authority of Parliament, the other defending the divine supremacy of their king, were locked in a deadly stalemate at York. Three hundred and fifty years ago, this city was an important political centre. This is King's Manor. Today, it's a university building. Originally, it was built to house the Council of the North. Since the mid 1400s, monarchs had relied on the council to bring law and order to these wild lands. When Charles was forced to leave London by a rebellious parliament in 1641, it was in York that he chose to reside. He stayed in this house for half a year while he sought to ensure the loyalty of his northern stronghold. He wined and dined leading townsmen and even set up his own printing press near the Minster to churn out royalist propaganda. Charles was deeply unpopular and needed York support. After 11 years of so-called tyranny, when Parliament had not been consulted, disputes over taxation, religion and censorship had plunged the country into political crisis. Within months of Charles' departure from the city in 1642, civil war erupted and York remained loyal to its monarch. In 1644, York itself became the battlefield. A joint parliamentarian force arrived on 17th of April to besiege the city. One half were Scotsmen under the command of Lord Lever. The others were part of a local Yorkshire regiment led by Ferdinando Fairfax, a York man born and raised and later his son, Thomas. They aimed to score a decisive victory by capturing the king's northern jewel. Fairfax set up his headquarters at Heslington Hall, which can be seen behind me. From this luxurious post, a plan was formulated to seize his hometown from the despised cavaliers. Despite heavily outnumbering York's royalist garrison of 4,000 troops, a direct assault on the city would be near impossible. Firstly, the Marquis of Newcastle, William Cavendish, who was defending York for the king, insisted cannons be placed on every bar of the city walls, as well as here at Clifford's Tower behind me. Also, ordinary citizens, women as well as men, were required to construct a series of trenches and earthworks in the surroundings to defend their city. By the time of the siege, the scale of these works was considerable. Finally, the old medieval walls were in excellent condition, as can still be seen today. With this in mind, the Parliamentarian Scott Coalition was forced into a campaign of trying to starve out the city. For five weeks, roundheads fall through layer on layer of defences. To keep the enemy at bay, the Royalists burned York's suburbs. This was common wartime practice to prevent the enemy from looting and sheltering, but it must have been hell for the residents who had to witness their homes being burned down. After the destruction, the city corporation would later remark, we have lost the suburbs which were our skirts. Our whole body is in weakness and distemper. Our merchandise and trade our nerves and sinews are weakened and become very mean and considerable. As war progressed, the army was billeted in people's homes for soldiers to home, which, which would have had a great impact. The soldiers were fed, and Newcastle, certainly um, during the siege of York, actually rations food so that people only get one square meal a day. Um, and, and, and basically um, centralises all the food. And so, the tide turned in favour of the attackers. On the 4th of June, Roundhead reinforcements arrived, with the Earl of Manchester at their head. Cavendish's only hope now was to repel any attacks while he awaited his own relief force, perhaps in the form of Prince Rupert, the King's nephew and a celebrated general in his own right. But Rupert was busy pacifying Lancashire at this time, 
So what followed at York was a tense deadlock interspersed with a parliamentarian bombardment of the city from the east. This was by no means a strategic bombing campaign. The cannons were far too inaccurate for that. Instead, the intention was to provoke terror among the population. At the sight of a cannonball hurtling towards you from the sky, wouldn't you be scared? These walls offered no protection against this new type of warfare. After tasting the frightening reality of Parliament's bombing campaign, on the 14th of June, Cavendish called for a ceasefire. Here at Heslington Hall, Fairfax and the other leading roundheads received a series of letters from that adversary requesting parley. Talks were eventually made, but terms could not be met. Perhaps this was a genuine attempt at peace. More likely, though, it was a cynical ploy by Cavendish to delay his attackers further. Well aware of Prince Rupert's approaching relief force, the parliamentarians stepped up the intensity of their attacks on the city walls. Signs of which are still visible, for example here at Warngate Bar. When these measures failed, a new tactic was deployed, that of mining under the walls in order to plant explosives. One such tunnel would have run roughly under where I'm standing now. And the Warngate Tunnel was soon discovered. A countermine was dug above that of the attackers and water poured down to flush out any explosives and miners still digging. On the 16th of June, the grounds of St Mary's Abbey were rocked by a great explosion. The defending tower was completely destroyed. For the resulting gap in fortifications, Manchester's excited men streamed in, only metres away at King's Manor were the Royalist soldiers, who met them immediately. What followed was a bitter struggle. A quick and rapid volley of musket fire decimated the approaching roundheads and sent them fleeing for the original breach from which they had entered. This was a brutal but short skirmish from which 300 men died. When Prince Rupert finally arrived in July, he skillfully hoodwinked the parliamentarian troops by unexpectedly approaching the city from the north. Realising they had been outmanoeuvred, the roundheads changed their tactics and marched southwest to reorganise and protect their supply lines. The very next day, on 2nd July 1644, Rupert and Cavendish jointly left York in pursuit of the parliamentarians. The Royalists caught up with them about four miles from the sea, at the now infamous Marston Moor. After ten weeks of stalemate, the battle began. The first signs York citizens received about the outcome of battle was seeing wounded cavaliers arrive at Micklegate Bar. Of the 4,000 men from the garrison that left for battle that day, only 500 returned. Many were cut down by parliamentarian cavalry with slashing swords to the backs of the necks, which is, um, you don't survive that. Um, and it is sad that 4,000 lined the road from Marston Moor to York. Those that survived, that got back to the gates of York, were denied entrance by Glennon, the governor, because he feared that the parliamentarians, hot on their tails, would also come into the city and ravage the city. And it wasn't until Prince Rupert arrived about 11 o'clock of the evening and demanded the gates be opened to the wounded and maimed survivors who were lucky to have gone that far. Marston Moor was a disastrous turn of events for the King. The pursuing parliamentarians resumed the siege, but the forces left within York's walls had neither the strength nor the stomach for this fight and surrendered within two weeks. So Charles had lost his northern capital. In 1649, five years later, he was deprived of his head too. At the time of the siege, the King had recognised the importance of York in a letter to Prince Rupert. He stated, with gloomy foreshadowing, If York be lost, I shall esteem my crown little less.